Before we start today's show, I just wanted to mention our sponsor, Money Farm. Now, Money Farm is a leading digital wealth manager with over 60,000 active investors and over £2 billion invested on its platform. It offers three investment products, including the Stocks and Shares ISA, a general investment account, and a personal pension. And by answering a few simple questions about your investment goals and attitude to risk, you'll be matched to one of seven globally diversified portfolios. Money Farm's expert team provides hands-on investment management by regularly adjusting and rebalancing your portfolio on your behalf. Your even get a dedicated investment consultant should you want to widen your investment plan something that sets it apart from most of its competitors the minimum investment amount is 500 pounds and fees range between 0.35 percent and 0.75 percent a year depending on the amount you have invested money to the masses listeners can take advantage of a special offer where money farm will run your money fee free for a year head to money to the masses.com and search money farm for more information Hello and welcome to episode 342 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Links and Damien. We've got a special this week. We've been promising it for a couple of weeks. It's the house buying special and actually we're going to run over into a two week special because we've got so much to talk about. So we're going to go straight into it this week, aren't we? What, what is it we're talking about this week? So the idea of the house buying special came from the fact that in our office we noticed that four or five of us had bought houses within the last 18 months and the journey is all slightly different and there is a whole process that goes on before during and almost after you bought a house that's a journey that people can learn a lot from and there's certain things you only really find out until you're doing it and so we were talking about our own experiences in the office and we said we must not share this on the podcast and we thought we'd wait until nearly everybody has completed their journeys and we're going to pull it all together so what we've got is Lauren is going to be on the podcast with you and I this week Andy and next week we were going to have more of us on the podcast as well but illness struck one or two people down but we're still going to be sharing their experiences now Lauren was a first-time buyer who got onto the property ladder couple of months ago Andy you were somebody who got onto well you'd owned a property previously then went back to renting and then bought a family home through shared ownership so it's a different journey again and I bought my second house just what weeks ago and so I finished that journey so we're all slightly different and I think everyone listening to the podcast can relate to one of our cases So the way we're going to do this is we're going to split the topic into two podcast episodes. Now, this show is going to deal with the preparation of buying a house and the finances. So it's leading up to the point where you may then look to the point where you get things in order, then you start to go and look for a house. So it's actually the beginning part of that dream. And it will conclude with putting in an offer on a house. Next week's show, we'll talk more about selling your own home, so the one you've already got, and it will deal with things you might want to do to help sell your house more quickly or get the maximum price. And we'll also touch upon things like solicitors, estate agents, and the process itself between actually finding a house and then exchanging and completing, and then a little bit after that as well. So there's a lot we're going to cover. Don't worry if you're not thinking about moving house now. If you're thinking about doing it at any point in the future, it could be a few years down the line, there's stuff you're going to want to know and things about your finances that you need to do ahead of time. So there is a lot in here. So don't just think, oh, I'm not interested and move on. There's going to be things in here that you'll probably want to tell maybe your own family members who you know are about to move and it might actually help them and make their dream more of a reality. And so let's move on to the podcast itself then and welcome Lauren back to the show. Lauren, first of all, congratulations on buying your first time. Thanks for having me back on the podcast. I can't wait to share with you my journey to buy my first home because it was a very long and eventful journey. It felt like the longest journey to buy in a house that I've known it was yeah I think it was made longer by the fact that we had this pandemic thing so you were kind of you know everyone's stuck at home and so it felt like you were stuck in this loop of just constant sort of what's happening what's happening you had additional complications as well and so talking about that Lauren how did it impact you how were you able to get yourself into the position because I think that's the first thing we really want to touch on people have that idea that they're dreaming of their first home what do they need to do first of all it's kind of to do with your finances right yeah so i have a lot of bad things to say about covid but covid to us was a bit of a help in terms of being able to get onto the property ladder 
And without that happening at that point, I'm not sure we would be in our first property today. Um, And that's purely because it just helped us to save. And not only that, from a selfish perspective, when you're obviously deciding to buy a house, you're not wanting to spend any money. So we couldn't go out and do anything, but it kind of helped the fact that no one else could either. So I didn't feel so hard done by when I was saving for a property because we were all sitting inside in our houses, not being able to leave. But what is interesting though, Lauren, because obviously the pandemic helped you boost your savings, but you already were saving a lot before then, weren't you? So you were doing it before we even got to the pandemic stage. So for people out there who are listening, who might be renting or who may be uh, wanting to get on the the property ladder, for you, what was one of the the, the catalysts pre-pandemic that kind of got this moving? Because there was a point where you would have thought, I'd like a house, but then actually making something a reality, there has to be a point or normally a catalyst yeah so we actually me and my partner jay we decided we were going to buy a property but how realistically were we going to do this and obviously working at money to the masses my personal finance knowledge was growing every day and we were reading a lot about lifetime isas so i said to jay we really need to open one of these. But a lifetime ISA obviously has to be open for a minimum of 12 months before you can purchase your first property. So I said, we need to open this as soon as possible because we want to buy a house as soon as we can. So we first started thinking about buying our house in June of 2019 when we opened our lifetime ISA and I opened mine from a pound and so did Jay because at that moment in time, I didn't have loads of money to stick into my lifetime ISA but I knew I needed to get the ball rolling and get it open. So both of us did that because both people wanting to buy a house for a first time can have a lifetime ISA. So the next thing we decided to do is we really needed to clear our debt so that we could then save into our lifetime ISA so that we had the money to do so. So we focused on clearing our debt, but knowing that we had our lifetime ISA open, ready for us to save into it once our debt was clear. But one of the biggest things then for people listening to the podcast who haven't heard previously about lifetime ISAs, it's the bonus, isn't it? That's why you really did it, is to get that 25% government bonus that you get when you put into this, there are limits. But did that accelerate the day that you could get your house? Did it make that much of a difference? Yeah, I would say to anyone wanting to buy a house for the first time, get a lifetime ISA. To me, it's a no brainer because it is essentially free money from the government. I mean, if you max out the ISA limit for your tax year, so you put in £4,000, you get £1,000 from the government. Why wouldn't you do that? And of course, both of you and Jay did the same thing. So you end up getting £2,000 worth of free money from the government. Yeah. and And a tip with the lifetime ISA as well was if you work out the tax years, you can put in £4,000 in March, say of 2020, like we did. But then as soon as the new tax year starts in April 2020, you could put in another £4,000. So essentially, you could have £10,000 once you've had the government bonus. So £4,000 plus the £1,000 government bonus twice within a short space of time, you've already grown your money significantly in that short period. And so, of course, like you said, you could do that again for you and Jay. So that could be multiplied to twice. You'd end up getting in a four grand bonus in the space of weeks. Of course, you have the money. So... For people out there, no one won't dwell on it because she did a podcast about how she cleared her debts and we can link to that in the show notes. And budgeting apps, wasn't it, Lauren? You love the budgeting apps. What's the one your favourite budgeting app that you think helped you the most? Uh, Probably Emma. You can narrow down your subscriptions and saying that also money dashboard though as well because it allows you to look at all of your accounts in one place. So you were using cash lifetime ISAs. I mean, you can have investment ones as well. And I mean, it's typically sensible to have a cash lifetime ISA if you're going to be buying in the next or less than five years time. I know you write about them, but you use some of the online digital banks now that allow you to budget and save into pots and things automatically. Yeah, so I've used both Monzo and Starlin. And in my opinion, I think they're brilliant purely from the perspective of using the pots, the saving pots. It allows you to separate your money. And I cannot manage my finances now without doing this. So when you get your salary every month when I was getting paid, I moved a large chunk of my salary into my savings pots. That was my house pot. And then later down the line, as I got further down the house buying journey, we were saving for other things when we moved in. So then I had a kitchen pot, a bathroom pot, a bills pot. I think it's so useful because you're separating your money without going across different bank accounts. And it's so easy to track your spending and your saving. So jumping across to Andy now, because we're going to cover lots of things that we all did. We're going to do it in the sort of same 
chronological order in a way. So, Andy, you bought your house back in 2019, was it? Yeah, just at the end of 2019, just before Christmas. There was a race to get in to get the Christmas tree up. So someone listening to this podcast is sitting there thinking, like, I want to get on the property ladder. Lauren did it where she ended up being able to afford to get a deposit, saved up enough and be able to get a mortgage. We'll come on to more of that in a minute. But then, of course, for you, where you lived and circumstance, obviously you wanted to go down the route of being able to buy a family home. And then you used shared ownership, didn't you? Yeah, so it's a slightly different situation for me. My wife and I, we bought a small flat many years ago. The financial crisis hit. We needed to move areas to extend our family. And so we rented for a period of time, really just to take stock of what we needed to do. When we were ready to buy, and at that point, house prices had gone up so much, we were actually priced out of the area, in essence. So it seemed a natural thing for us to look at other alternative options. And actually, there's quite a lot of new builds happening in our area. And so it was quite easy for us to sign up for what is a shared ownership scheme, and which I kind of scoffed at at first. I didn't think it was potentially for me. But actually, it worked out perfectly for us because if you think about our situation, we were previous owners. So we'd lost all those benefits that first time buyers get, such as things like lifetime ISAs and stamp duty reductions. So being second time purchasers, but then effectively starting again. And don't forget, we lost out because of the financial crisis. We lost our deposit that we put down on our first property because of the way property prices worked. So we were really starting from the bottom up again. And because we've been renting for many years, it was really difficult for us to save up a side sizable deposit. So that's the situation we found ourselves in. You know, many people will be in a similar situation. And so shared ownership was the right move for us. And it continues to be something I'm, I'm really happy that we did. Because as far as I'm concerned, we are owners of our property. The housing association that effectively owns the other proportion of our property, they don't get involved too much. It's not like renting. People think that being a shared owner means that you have people coming around checking up on you. They don't. As far as they are concerned, it's an investment for them. You are paying them a rent for that property and the property is yours to do with what you wish. Yes, you do have to speak to them if you want to make modifications and improvements, but that's fine. Nine times out of time, they'll be happy for you to do it because, of course, they want you to look after the property. So at what point did you then go down the shared ownership route in terms of your thought process? Because before you would have been thinking, I want to save, I'm going to buy a house. But then there was a point where you suddenly must have thought, well, do you know what? Actually, I'm going to explore this shared ownership route and the implications for me. When did that happen? How far before you actually started to, well, you bought the house at the end of 2019? Was it a year in advance, six months? When did that occur? For us, it happened relatively quickly. New properties were being built. They were being advertised locally. You see the big hoardings at the side of the road, shared ownership opportunities. We put the inquiries in and we got the ball rolling. I would say within two or three months, we'd been accepted onto that scheme. And we knew within sort of nine to 12 months, we could be moving in. Of course, we had to come up with a deposit, but because it was shared ownership, that was much lower. So it was a really quick process. And in fact, the only real delay to that whole process was the new build itself it was a new property. And so you get these sort of deadlines, you think you're going to move in, and then it gets pushed on and pushed on and pushed on because of, well, construction, it takes time. So in summary, I mean, that process from beginning to end was was just a few months. So actually thinking about you, though, Damien, you've been thinking about this for quite a while, haven't you? So what was your process leading up to your house? I mean, some people end up moving because of necessity. So some people move because they need to get this children into certain schools or because of jobs and that kind of makes the process it, it makes there's constraints on there so where you can live or what you can afford to do you kind of have to just react there are things in life that you can try and look into the future and, and be wondering what might happen so for me for example I lived in my first ever house for 14 years and it got to the point where I was thinking well it's kind of getting to like a now or never scenario it was our first ever house we bought but obviously I'm in my 40s now and you start thinking the point where you're getting older and whether you want to take on a another mortgage so we started to think about obviously where we lived where we wanted to move it to somewhere that's slightly bigger whether we had more space as our children got older in schools all these things and this was all playing in the back of my mind for quite some time so there wasn't the necessity but the one thing I would say is that from the moment that I'd been thinking about moving to the point I actually did was probably about two years. I didn't talk about it on the podcast, but it's something that I was mindful of. And so I started to try and move almost like the chess pieces in the in, in, in the right place so I could get to the point this year, which was pretty much checkmate. And by that, I mean that there are a lot of things that you have to get to work in unison in order to be able to buy a house and sort of 
make your dream happen. So for me, I had to be the reality that what did I want for my new house? Where did I want to live? What type of house would it be? The things I didn't like. And of course, all of that dictates suddenly the price of the house or where you could live. So we've done all of that. We started to go and look at other areas and we started to look at places that might be cheaper and started to look at what life would be like. And so that happened for about a good year before we then sort of started to realise that we did want to stay in the area that we were in, but that did put a constraint on perhaps what we could afford and therefore what we'd need to do in terms of finances. So therefore, I had to start looking at, well, how am I going to manage my finances to be able to maximise the amount I could borrow and the house I could buy. So the whole process was probably about two years. I'm going to kind of run through some things that I was doing in the background. So I go back two years ago, I was conscious that obviously I needed to sell my house, but I didn't know I would actually therefore move. So I actually did my kitchen and bathroom up. I hadn't done it in the 10, 12 years previous to that when we lived there. And so I was conscious of that, that that could add value to the property. There were agents out there and people who were saying, no, you don't need to do that. People just come into your house, have their own views of bathrooms and they will just change it. But my experience, that's not technically true. If you make it look amazing, and you don't have to do it expensively, but we sort of redid the whole lot, then it did end up, we'll come on to it in the next podcast, but it did end up making it easier to buy a house. But what I did do is I then didn't review my mortgage at that point and lock myself into a fixed term deal. Because I knew there was potential that I could end up moving in the next couple of years. So I didn't fix my rate. I had stayed on my my lender's variable rate that I was on that was incredibly beneficial because of the financial crisis. I was one of those people that benefited from that. And lots of people have stayed on their lender's variable rates because rates are so low. And so what I did is I borrowed some money, additional borrowing rather than a remortgage from the same lender because it meant that it was easier to process. But I kept the term of that additional small amount of borrowing the same as my overall mortgage term and it was a slightly different rate because they'd obviously pulled the very generous rate i was on before but it meant i hadn't locked myself in i'm always planning for flexibility so my story is very much one about flexibility i didn't know if i'd end up staying in my house if i did then i'd have a new kitchen and bathroom so i'd be happy but if i didn't then hopefully that kitchen and bathroom would help sell the house and of course We know what happened in the market, house prices went up, and ultimately we did end up moving. But the journey I want to get people to think about, if you're thinking of moving or might move, you might need to move areas for your kids to go to certain schools, or you might move because of jobs, or you just want to move generally, is that I started looking at my finances probably a year to 18 months before I actually moved. And when I say look at my finances, I started going through and I wasn't living like a nun, but I started going through my direct debits and cancelling anything. I was looking at everything with a real crucial, do I need this? Can I reduce this bill? Can I cut it down? Because I knew that when I was going to go to a mortgage lender, they were going to do the same thing, look at all my bills and go, well, Damien's committed to spending this amount a month. So I went through, cut back every bill, set myself a challenge, see, could I, could I knock 10, 20% off each bill? Well, it is possible if you do shop around. Or do I even need it? Cancel gym memberships, that kind of stuff, subscriptions to things I didn't really need. So I started going down that road. You guys, I know, were doing similar things in the background when you did yours. Yeah, so we looked at our bills. Our biggest thing when we were looking to cut back our finances was clear the debt. We had a credit card that was taking up most of our salary each month trying to clear that. So that was our main priority because we weren't going to be able to buy a house or save for a deposit to buy a house without clearing that. And then like you, we looked at our direct debits and things that we were paying out for, like, you know, our uh, subscriptions to uh, Netflix, Spotify, things like that. To be honest, we kept most of ours because I'm quite frugal anyway. You know that I always look at my finances. It was more so cutting back on uh, trivial things and then cutting back on traveling and going out for dinners with friends. Like if you want to save for a house to get on the property ladder, you have to be brutal. You have to make those sacrifices and not go out. It's just how it is, unfortunately. I mean, I, I ditched Sky TV in the middle of a pandemic. I was looking at it and the amount of money it costs and people think, well, you're indoors and you're going to ditch it. But it, I looked at what we were getting from it and I then decided that it wasn't good value for money for me and my family. But then I diverted that money to saving it. And Picking up on what Lauren said, and I don't know if this is going to be the same for you, Andy, I, in the space of two years, became aggressive with trying to save money because I didn't know what would happen. So the worst case scenario, if I didn't move, I just had a 
bigger rainy day fund and we could maybe do something with it. But I was trying to save money. All that money I was cutting back on, I was just pretending that I didn't have it and I was just putting it to one side. And the tip I would give people was what I was also doing was trying to save up the stamp duty and the agent's fees and the solicitor's fees and be able to try and pay for much of that as I could out of cash savings. And the reason I wanted to do that is because it increases the ability that I could buy a house that I would want. Because there's nothing worse when people go looking for a house. You go, this is the house that we like and we need. And then you realize that you've got to pay all those things out the difference between what you sell your house for and what you bought it for. The dream sort of quickly disappears. So I knew that the sums were going to be pretty simple. What did I make profit wise for my house? How much could I borrow? Do you know what? There's one thing I would say as well that I found, particularly with having the lifetime ISA, was that the money was almost out of sight, out of mind. And that really helped with the savings process because you were not tempted at all to dip into that money. And that was the same throughout the whole savings process. We could see it building up, particularly when we were saving before we deposited it, depending on whether we'd maxed out our ISA limit. But because it wasn't there, we didn't miss it. We couldn't see it. Or if there was a day where we particularly needed money, we could not withdraw it because we would be subject to a 25% withdrawal penalty. So that is one thing to consider if you are buying a house for the first time. A lifetime ISA forces you to save and you can't access that money. But even if you aren't using a lifetime ISA, because say you're my age, if you have it in a, an interest account that's got a time frame on it, that means you get a penalty if you lose interest if you withdraw it. So it might be... Uh, a fixed term like cash bond or it might be one that has a sort of 90 day access rule on it so you can't access your money within 90 days without some kind of penalty similar thing yeah i don't want to sugarcoat it it's uh, it's quite a tough time going through that sort of process but you've got to think about how much you want it i cut down our food bill by approximately 20 percent, which doesn't sound a lot but it is when you add it up month after month after month and do you know what we didn't have horrible food we had lovely food we were just mindful of what we were doing we were throwing throwing away less food, we're making use of leftovers. And it's all those little things that you can do over many months that make a massive difference. And one of the things I know we didn't go on holiday and stuff like that. And I know the pandemic happened in that interim period as well. But the thing was, if we hadn't moved, we would have been able to then go on to like a really nice holiday. So it wasn't like anyone was missing out. It was just deferring it just for the flexibility because it was around the period that my daughter was changing schools and things as well. So I think if everyone's on board in the family, like, do you know what, this is what we're going to do for flexibility, just to see what happens, a contingency, then worst case, we just stay where we are. That's a really good way to think about it, that you're doing those things, you're making the sacrifices for the end goal. And like you just said, the end goal might not be moving, but then you've got that sort of contingency fund that stuff it. If it doesn't work out, we'll go on holiday. Go yeah, and, and one of the things that I, I want to make people think about is that there are decisions that have like kind of a cascade that can end up causing you not problems, but will have impacts on you borrowing money in the future. So for example, getting a second car. Now there are loads of people who get a second car. If you don't get a second car on finance, and instead you put that money away, but it's not even about you putting that money away if you didn't, it's about when you go and get a mortgage, they will look at your car payments as a commitment that will reduce your affordability. So don't do it. So it's difficult in our family because we've only got one car, and sometimes you would like to have two, but I just see them as a money pit. And so what we did is go like, do you know what, for this period of time, we will not get or even think about a second car, but of course what it meant is that when we came to the assessment for affordability, they just look at you and go, well, there isn't a, lots of car payments going out. And I know people love cars and they really want to be, some people want to drive around and be flash, but that's priority. So that is going back to the point that I mentioned earlier about credit. Don't keep taking out credit in the lead up to it in the next couple of years. Think about your credit cards you've got, reduce your debt, that's what we did, get it down to credit utilisation levels that are probably about 15% or something, which is pretty good. That means that you aren't using all your available credit balance. You might only be using 15, 20% of it. You're managing all your debt. For me, it was using the credit card. Yes, you could use it as cash flow during the month, but you clear it at the end of the month. It just shows that you are a sensible borrower. So you just need to behave like one in the lead up. One thing I would mention though, is that we'll probably touch upon it in the next podcast. Think about the credit that you've got. Because when you move house, one thing you're going to struggle with is getting new credit because you're not going to be on the electoral roll. You're not going to have your address on certain things. It's universal that I know of uh, taking a very small sample of about three people that I know have moved house recently. Two people 
apply for credit cards out of that three and both of them were rejected and there was no reason why they would have got rejected it's simply because they changed the dress so you aren't going to be able to move into a house and go look we're going to kit it out with all this amazing gear you need to make sure you've got that availability of credit before you do it because you won't want to be taking out any credit during the process or in the lead up to trying to get a mortgage so before we move on to the next part of the podcast where we're going to be talking about how to get the mortgage who to speak to that kind of thing let's sort of finish this section off then the preparation part is there any other tips you give them yeah so i would say look at your standing orders because i know there'll be people out there who may have borrowed money for example from a family member to maybe they're doing something to their house or whatever and they're paying back regular amounts of money to somebody if you are doing that I suggest that what you do instead is because you're saving up money now because you've cleared your debts and it would accelerate the speed at which you can save money is go to that person and say, do you know what I'm going to do, Dave? I'm going to give you six months of this money up front and then I'm going to start paying again in a few months time or six months time. Because what that will do is at the point when you go to get a mortgage, they will tend to look at three to six months worth of your bank statements. That won't show. And yet you are maintaining your commitment to give someone some money back or whatever. And you're not doing anything deceitful. It's up to you. It's a personal loan. And some lenders do sort of discount that anyway. So what you want to do is readjust your finances. So just they're palatable to lenders, for example. The other thing I did is I paid a lot of insurances annually. Not only is that cheaper to do that because you're not paying them monthly and therefore having to pay a charge effectively for credit. If you pay them annually, so let's say you've got private medical insurance, pay it annually. A lender is not going to ask you, do you have private medical insurance, which you pay for annually? They're going to look at your monthly commitments. So there are things like that. There's nothing wrong with that. But you just need to make sure that when you present your case to the lender, that you're going to be aware of the information that they look at. The other thing I'd quickly say is check all your credit reports. We did a podcast on that. 340 was a podcast, how you can check all your credit reports for free. Make sure there's no mistakes. You need to be doing that way in advance in case there are mistakes. So a year, 18 months. And I'd also, if you are a couple, make sure the other person is on the bills of the house. So you say you are a married couple, then why aren't they on the bills? I know it can happen where you switch energy bills and things like that, that they actually they somehow just disappear off the bill. And it's only one of your names. The reason you want to do that, because it's good for their credit file, but it's also because when you come to money laundering and you've got to prove who you are and all this kind of thing when you do your mortgage application, they ask for a utility bill. And I tell you what, there's nothing worse than if you get to the point you apply for a mortgage and you fail money laundering checks. That's going to have your whole dream of getting a house start to come crashing down or delay things at best. So like, if you're being married and there's things that are in your maiden name, change them to your married name. So it might be your council tax or stuff like that so it's all tied up and yeah. everything's okay the other thing i would say quickly before we uh, move on to the mortgage side of things i've talked about your outgoings but your income so if you're employed it might be handy to get a pay rise in the in the lead up to that so you might want to put a bit of extra shift in because you'll get certain multiples i've heard anecdotally of people who have asked for their bonus to be paid as a salary over the 12 months because some lenders won't take bonuses into consideration so it's a way of them being able to boost their salary i mean that's down to the individual employer but you could ask that question yeah and also i know there are lots of people out there who run businesses so i know the realities are that people either look to pay themselves whether it's salary and dividends and they might look to do it in a tax efficient way but it may be better to not do it as tax efficiently, just so you have a higher salary. And the message is that you have control over that. And so what will happen is that if you've got a business, they will likely look at your earnings average over a couple of years. Well, you need to make sure in the lead up to that, that you've got the earnings that we're going to need to be able to buy the house that you want or just set yourself a realistic target of what your earnings actually are or what they're likely to be in the lead up to when you're trying to buy a house in two years time and so you've got to be mindful of the fact that you've got to know what your house is worth and what you want to buy this all starts to set your budget and ultimately that might dictate when you even move let's think if you've got a business and it's suddenly going to have some investment or it's going to be expanded or it's doing really well then you might delay your move because you might decide well the business is doing really well and the outlook is great for the next two years well if we delay the move for 18 months then we can suddenly buy a bigger house because the lender will use multiples based on the last two years do you know what i mean so it can make a difference by delaying your house move by one year you could end up buying a, a much bigger or better house if you wanted to so it's one of those things you have to be mindful of your income as well okay so just to move the podcast on i'm thinking now about actually the mortgage point so i've talked about the prep stuff or we all have but 
I mean, you guys, at what point did you then think, I'm going to start trying to get a mortgage? Because there will be people like uh, out there, like you, Lauren, who in your scenario, they're saving and saving and saving. And then they're thinking, well, when do I go and speak to somebody or who do I speak to? Similarly, you, Andy, with your shared ownership, how does that work? I mean, I can share my own experiences, but to start with you, Lauren, I mean, what point did you think, right, I'm actually going to go for it now. We don't have to just keep saving. I'm going to try and actually buy something. So about six months before we had an offer accepted on our house, so it was around June in 2020, I contacted a mortgage advisor, which was a recommendation from a friend, and they'd used her to buy their first house and actually their second house, because I wanted to know how much we could borrow, particularly as a first-time buyer, how much did I need to save for my deposit to be able to buy my first house, and I didn't know how much this was. So yeah, it was about six months prior to us having the offer accepted and properly looking that we found out how much we could borrow so that we knew how much to save. But at that point, you didn't have zero in your bank account. I mean, what what was the trigger? So you, you must have been a number that we used to thinking, well, I've got one of 50 quid, 100 quid. There must have been a point where you went, right, I think we've got enough to actually have a serious conversation here. What was that? So roughly in my head, I knew that we would need around 10%. So we was going to try and get a 90% mortgage. But when we had about 5%, that was when we found out exactly how much we could borrow. So we knew a benchmark of how much longer we had to kind of get to the 10% deposit that we would probably need. And this is where the pandemic didn't help you because the amount you could borrow when you had the first conversation to when you subsequently then went to try and get a mortgage was different, wasn't it? Yeah, so we were speaking to the mortgage advisor right in the middle when lenders decided to scrap 90 and 95% mortgages. So we had to sit tight and wait for a while and just keep squirrelling our money away and saving and hoping that lenders would start to reintroduce the 90% mortgages. But when we first spoke to the mortgage advisor, they said we could borrow a certain amount. But then by the time lenders had decided that they were going to lend 90% mortgages again, this amount that we could borrow had actually dropped by £25,000, which is obviously a massive difference, particularly when you're looking at houses, you can get a lot more for your money with £25,000 more that you can borrow than what you could. So this really affected the vision we had for our first house and what exactly we were able to buy. We kind of went from one type of properties down and we really had to start thinking outside of the box and outside of the area we wanted to live in. Did all the mortgage brokers welcome you with open arms when you tried to contact them? No, right at the beginning it was really frustrating. I tried a range of mortgage brokers. I tried ones that were online because I just wanted to know how much we could borrow and I did the online calculators as well. You know when you go on these websites and you put in your salary, your partner's salary. And to be honest, those calculators kind of underestimated by quite a a bit what we could actually borrow. So it's always good to actually speak to a proper mortgage advisor. But when we went to them, they just kept saying to us, come back, come back. And I don't know if that was because of COVID, you know, lenders were introducing tougher borrowing requirements, but they just said, come back again, come back again. And that was quite frustrating as a first time buyer, because I'm like, well, how much do I need then? Is someone actually going to tell me just to give the flip side of that some of those calculators online are basically end up being lead generators they're giving some general information because they want you to engage with them and so they aren't always as, as useful or as accurate and they do apparently tailor and tighten the criteria in the background to generate better leads or just to cut back on the number of inquiries they get and also the mortgage brokers they were probably thinking that there are a lot of people out there who do waste time i mean in their defense who just sit there have no intention of ever buying a house so but going back to your earlier point finding a mortgage broker who has helped somebody and is a recommendation from somebody you know in the same position as you, so a first-time buyer, is helpful because they, you know, they're an, ex- they're an expert and they know that part of the market very well, but also you know they actually give you the time of day. I'll cut in there and just say that if you're one of those people that isn't lucky enough to know someone who's in that situation, so I'm going to play the other side because I used an online broker. I didn't have any recommendations from friends and I like technology and I I actually value my time. So I thought I'll give these guys a go. There are lots of online brokers out there. There's Trussell, Habito, to name just a couple. And I found the experience largely positive. There are frustrations and limitations as to the kind of access you get to these people because a lot of it is online chats, but that's how they're able to get through lots of people in a short amount of time. And 
actually, do you know what? If they say they're going to do something, they go off and do it. And they're actually very proactive. And because they've only got to go on a chat box and put a reply to you, that's two minutes of their time. And you do often get a response relatively quickly. I have to say, during that process, I remember you being very complimentary about it in terms of the responsiveness you were getting. And because they have portals, which you load all the documents up into, you avoid all that email exchange, have you sent over your passport and all this thing. And then it's going around in some weird loop. It's there. And I, I think, would you use them again? So if you had the same, you're moving house again, would you use the same online provider rather than going to find a, a mortgage broker you knew in person? Well, I would. And actually, I've recently done a remortgage for them. So that goes to show that obviously, I would recommend doing it. I wasn't put off by getting my initial mortgage because I did my remortgage through them. The only thing I would say is you don't often deal with the same person again. They've got quite a lot of number of staff at these places. Some staff do move on, maybe high staff turnover. And so you do have to kind of deal with the fact that you'll just be dealing with whoever's dealing with your case that day. You won't necessarily have one name that you're going to be dealing with, but that's fine for some people. And from my own personal experience, I go back to what Lauren said and reiterate, if you are somebody who might be running the business, then go and speak to somebody who is a recommendation, who you know, somebody who might be running the business or whatever it is, the same scenario as you, it makes a massive difference. I actually spoke to the mortgage broker more than a year before I was going to move and to say to them, like, look, here's all my cards on the table. What am I likely to be able to borrow? And of course, then I had to get a valuation of my own property, which is um, very easy to sort out. You get an estate agent to come around. They're happy to do it. It's basically a way of them getting around your house and trying to convince you to move, you work out what you owe on your mortgage, what you might sell it for. You can work all this stuff out yourself in terms of looking at things like right move and property portals. And then looking at your salary, you can see what you're likely to be able to be working with. But then also you can therefore look at potentially what you could borrow in certain scenarios. Let's say you had a business and it has a downturn or it has a positive year. You can start to judge what the reality is going to look like what the dream's going to look like in in the future and then you can set expectations accordingly so for me i went and probably spoke to a mortgage broker 18 months before kept in touch with them and then when it came to the point that i was going to actually use them it was even smoother because they already had a load of details about me and it was just giving them up to date facts and figures. One thing I would also add, if you use a normal broker, I say normal broker, I mean someone who's not online, they don't necessarily have a property portal or anything like this. It's very much you'll email them back and forth and a few phone calls. I would definitely rob an idea from those online portals because what I did was create a drive in, in the cloud. So there's lots of things like Dropbox, Google, cloud where you can use services that you can create a folder which you give very specific people access to and in that folder you can put all the details that you need say like copies of your pay slips copies of your passports copies of marriage certificates utility bills all this stuff so therefore there isn't this things getting lost on email or them saying oh can i have a pay slip and you've got i've already sent it to you you've got it in one place so they just go and get busy and do their thing and the interactions are much less and it made the application process much smoother don't get me wrong it took six weeks to get my mortgage approved but there was no back and forth from us and the lender it was just that, that was the cue because of it was post pandemic but it meant that I'd increased all my chances of getting the mortgage because I knew the multiples, but like we said we did a podcast on it that I was, could possibly get. I had all my earnings nailed down and my bills and everything like that. So the chances were high, not guaranteed, but they were higher than normal. And then when it came to applying, it really was the mortgage guy just then pushing it through. And I would always say to people, do use a mortgage broker because you can do these things directly, but the rate you'll get or whether you'll get accepted or not is going to have a big impact on you going forward if you get rejected then it's going to have an impact on your ability to perhaps be able to get another offer from some, from another lender so mortgage brokers i do think they are a time in life where you get advice and another thing to mention is some people assume or think that they're expensive you have to pay fees most mortgage brokers won't ask for an upfront fee and those that do will often offset that fee based on what they get paid from the lender. It's called a proc fee. So don't be put off approaching and talking to a mortgage broker. They're there to help you out. And don't worry, they get paid handsomely by the lender themselves. So definitely do it. Yeah, and I do think being a mortgage broker, it's very admin intensive. That's why some of them do charge up front to cover that. And I've had 
mixed stories. I've had people who've been charged a few hundred pound up front by a mortgage broker, which is offset against the money they would get at the back end. So you're not paying them twice. You're actually just offsetting what they're ultimately going to get. So you pay the same as if they were just getting paid on the back end by the product provider. But if it all falls through, you've lost that money. So you actually pull out or you don't like the service you're getting. So I've heard people who have had a bad experience where they've paid for something and not got the service and then end up using another broker. But equally, I've heard people who get a great service because the mortgage broker is more inclined to actually put in the hours because in defense of mortgage brokers out there, they put in the work and are hoping to get paid once you actually move into a long drawn out process. One other final thing before we move on to, I suppose, just quickly talking about when we found houses and looking at them is that when you borrow money, do your sums, but do give yourself some wiggle room. So it goes back to that contingency buffer because there's a good chance, especially in this market, that your house will be downvalued. And it's something we'll talk about in the next episode. But my house was downvalued, which I sold it for. And it's, uh, it's an interesting story in itself. But they give you the sort of buffer to be able to cope with something like that and stop your dream collapsing. And not only that, if all goes well, then it means you've got a little bit left over to actually use in your new house to be able to do it up. And I have to say that I'm not trying to get people to borrow irresponsibly. You won't get approved it by the lender for starters, but it's just to let people realise you're going to have this over 25 years. Yes, it'd be more expensive. Yes, you'll pay interest. But it was something that I did because I was selling a house. I kept a little bit of the equity out of my old house and therefore borrowed a little bit more than I needed to from the lender. And so before we move on, let's talk about the agreement in principle, because that's what we're all hoping to get before we start looking around properties. What is it? What does it mean? And when do you get it? It effectively just means that they're willing to potentially lend you the money. They're looking at very high level information you've given them. Uh, This is the the lender. And then they can equally refuse to give you the mortgage. From the get-go, from the the initial. Yeah, yeah. so they can give you the agreement in principle, but it doesn't mean they're actually going to give you the money ultimately. So when you've got the agreement in principle, like I said, the six-week window, they gave me an agreement in principle. said, yeah, given what you've told us or the broker had told them, yeah, we would lend you some money. And that is therefore um, the money that you wanted. But then they've got to do all the underwriting and then they get all the information and then they sort of look at the evidence and then they make a decision. It could be that you don't get it. But really, agreement in principle just gives you the idea that, hey, we're pretty serious about this. So you hear from estate agents, they will often say that they need to see an agreement in principle. And actually, Lauren, you you had this experience when you were looking, right? Yeah, now I don't know if it was exclusive to COVID because that was when we were looking at properties, but estate agents asked for proof of our agreement in principle and actually went one step further. They asked for proof of our savings, our deposit. I had to send screenshots. I mean, I'm not even sure if they're supposed to do this, but I had to send screenshots of our deposit over to prove that we were serious about buying a property and we weren't able to look with some estate agents at the properties without sending this stuff over. I mean, I think that they clearly overstepped the mark. And I don't care if there's estate agents who listen to this who will say otherwise. The agreement in principle for me got to the point where I had to have sold my house, apparently, I had to have had an offer accepted on it before they would let me view somewhere. Now, a lot of this came about because of COVID. So they obviously were limiting the number of people who were going around viewing houses. They didn't want the carpet treaders So they decided that this was the best way to do it. But they have kept some of those rules in place and it does benefit them as agents. And I do kind of get that when you're selling. I'd much rather people come around my house who've actually sold their house than people who are just in a pipe dream. I mean, just because you had an offer accepted on your house doesn't mean someone's going to actually buy it. But I can kind of get it. But you don't technically have to. I know people who just haven't done any of that and have been around and viewed houses when I bought my first house, for example, I didn't have an agreement in principle before I looked. Okay, so let's move on then. The agreement in principle is there. You know how much you're going to be able to borrow. You've done all your savings. The hard work is done. Now it's time to look at new properties. What are the tips we can give about putting in offers, looking around properties, that kind of thing? So what we did is we I actually read the article that is on the Money to the Message website, which gives us the tips to do when looking at a property And I used to those tips. So we'll link to that checklist actually in the show notes because that's a a, that's a really good article. And so you used that and went through it. Yeah, we we used it and we drove past some of the properties. So we decided there was a particular property that we wanted to look at, and we decided to drive past it one evening to be like, oh yeah, let's actually have a look where this is because that is one of the tips. And as we drove past, we noticed that the neighbour had a 
car on the drive and it had no tires and then behind the car there was about 20 tires piled up leaning against the side of the house and we just looked at each other and we were like yeah no we're not going to look at that <laughs> one because if that's what it's like now can you imagine it'll probably be like a car garage every weekend and I mean each to their own but I did not want to live next to that personally so we wrote that property off straight away and in a way actually I found when you're looking for a property we were trawling through the sites like right move every night saving down all these properties but driving past the area and looking before you actually arrange viewing helped us narrow them down because we were like oh actually that one doesn't work because I can't park there that one doesn't work because it was really hard to turn around in that one's not great because it's right next to a school and this is where estate agents are going to thank us because they would prefer that too right I imagine it's going to cut out the, the carpet treaders the people who aren't serious there's nothing worse than someone turning up and you know straight away before you walk through the door this is not a place I want to live in and then you go through that sort of merry dance with the estate agent where you're, you're smiling awkwardly and both of you know this isn't going to work yeah, you have to be quite bold about it I mean you have to tell them like why did you show me that house that I told you I didn't want the house like that and I think when we were looking because we'd done the sort of kind of like a drive-by that Lauren says but much more like, will we live in this area? Do we want to? We're doing, we're trying to work out what our budget would go to and what we'd get. And you start to kind of zero in on what reality is going to start to look like. Then you have to start prioritizing, like we did, what was most important to us. And like, would you like, whether it's having the driveway, whether it's the style of house, all these different things, whether it's close to certain schools. And then you get a priority of that. And you're, you're never going to get 10 out of 10. Trust me, if you've got 10 out of 10 on a house, you've done well. But normally you get about 7 out of 10 and that's going to be probably good enough. You'll be happy there. But I think that's a good tip that Lauren said. Go there different times of day. For me, it was funny because I only looked at my house once. I've broken every golden rule in the playbook about going to see it multiple times, different times of the day. Because the market is the way it is, there aren't houses. And it was just very difficult to find a house that you liked. And one came on the market and I saw it before it really got on the market properly. And there's always that estate agent nonsense where they're trying to push up demand don't forget i was selling my own house so i'm seeing it from the other side but i was quite fortunate because liam who wrote that checklist happened to be with me at the time that i was going because i got him to look at another house that was a second viewing that we quite liked and we went in there and he just looked at it and just went i could see by his face it was like this is this is a disaster don't buy this house it's like okay so that was sometimes getting the second opinion with somebody else who is not emotionally attached to it and i'd uh, say so you can't Everyone can't take Liam around, but you can have somebody who knows a bit about property or someone else who's just a friend who will be objective. And it, it, it coincided then that we just happened to go and see this other property. And obviously me and Kelly loved it, but I could see separately. It was like having a second viewing because it was somebody who was independent. We were in there for a long time and then made up our mind because they see things that you don't. You might be getting carried away with the garden, for example, but someone who's independent has just noticed there's a whacking great big damp patch in the ceiling in the spare room that is probably meaning the roof's falling down. As you're looking around that property as well, be mindful of the fact that that might not even be there when you come to move in. So just make sure you ask the right questions to the estate agent. I mean, you were completely different. You didn't even look around your house because it didn't exist. Yeah, it was difficult for me, actually, because we were having to work from drawings and kind of picture what it might look like in the end. And of course... Can I ask, did the artist's impression look like the house that you eventually lived in? If I was to give it a, a rating out of 10, I would say it was 7 out of 10. It was pretty, pretty accurate, <laughs> pretty accurate. It didn't have the overhanging garage that we could see out of our lounge, which really frustrated. Because when we went round, the last time we could look at our property before we moved in was three months prior. And so when we went into the property and it looked out of our lounge at the back of the property, we had a lovely view of the fields. And I, I couldn't believe our luck. I said, this is brilliant. I can't wait to move in. When we came to move in, they'd subsequently built a garage uh, just behind our property, which, of course, when we looked at the proper plans, it was there. But you're looking at a flat 2D image from above. You don't appreciate how that will cut the light out of your property. So, yeah, we kind of uh, we, we kind of didn't appreciate that. But, that, hey, these things happen. On new builds. So another thing, actually, just going back to that list that we were talking about that's on the site, I had loads of the property portals on my phone, uh, particularly right move that I looked at every day, and I saved the properties. And there was this particular property that we really liked, and we were tracking it over time. And initially, when it came on, it was out of our budget. And we were like, oh, we really like this property, out of budget. But it stayed on for about three months. I thought, why isn't this house selling? And then it got reduced stayed on for a bit longer, 
still not selling. So they couldn't sell this property. And I think basically they had just overestimated what the property was worth. So then it came off of a sale with, with this particular estate agent. Then it went up for rent. We were like, oh, okay, right, this property is up for rent. Maybe we could um, inquire about renting the property with the view to buy, knowing that it had been up for sale. Then after about a week, it went off for rent. And I was like, what is going on with this property? And literally a week after it came back on again with another estate agent, but the property price had reduced by about 30 grand. And I thought, what is going on here? But we then wanted to view this property because it was now in our budget. So we went round and I was asking the estate agent loads of questions. And he was going, yeah, there's loads of viewings on this property. It's only been on the market for two weeks. And I went, oh, that's funny because it was on the market about six months ago for about 30 grand more. And he went, oh, oh yeah, it was, weren't it? And I thought, <laughs> yeah, I've caught you out there, mate. I know what you're saying. <laughs> and it was really funny because I knew straight away that the property probably wasn't worth what it was initially marketed for and that if we wanted to make an offer we had a bit of leeway and we could go in because I knew they couldn't sell this house. And you didn't end up buying that one anyway did you? Well in the end we actually made an offer on the property and the person selling the property was really greedy and he asked for two and a half grand more uh, so we decided no this property is actually not worth that and they had loads more viewings and then it didn't sell and funnily enough in three or four weeks time they actually reduced it to the price that we had offered originally and I thought well more for you because we'd found another property by then and they'd lost out so we actually had the last laugh but it's quite an important point there never offer more than what you think the property is yeah worth. And, and I think that's a brilliant point before we wrap up the show is that if you're making an offer on the house you've got to look at the the value is it good value and you don't want to get carried away because there's plenty more houses out there i know in the market at the moment that demand is outstripping supply but this, these things go in cycles and it will change so it's one of those scenarios don't overpay for your property that you fall in love with because it's very easy to end up regretting it another tip i'd give is to sell yourself to the people you're buying from if you get that opportunity there are lots of times when you'll get to meet the people in person so why not use that opportunity to sell yourself as a buyer to increase your chances of seeing that through because don't forget they want the most money of course but they also want the path of least resistance and if you're going to be that person that's going to be able to push that through as smoothly as possible then the likelihood is you, they're going to love you yeah and i think you're right because in my own experience i did that in the first house i ever bought the person i I knew at that point be able to there was a multiple people putting up the same offers in and the fact that I just used the idea that I knew the world of finance and I was going to be able to get the mortgage all these stories you tell and they were true but it meant that compared to other people it might give me an extra chance also the fact that like if you've if you've sold your house and it's a chain of one and you're buying a house and it's been your chain is going to be tiny if you all tie up that's got an appeal i mean put it this way if i was selling the house i'd much rather have a chain which only got one other person in it rather than three four five because when you get long chains you get long delays okay so i think that pretty much wraps up podcast one of our two podcast special about the house buying process thank you lauren for being part of that we will be back again next week won't we damien and we're going to be covering the next phase of the process so we're going to be talking about selling your house, so tips that we've got. We're also going to be talking about things like estate agents and solicitors and really going from the point of making an offer to the point of being able to exchange and complete. There's a whole load of events that occur. Just having your offer accepted on a house you want to buy, but also selling your own, there's a whole journey you've got to get through. That's the first, that's the easy bit. So we're going to cover all of that. So hopefully the route to exchange and then completion will run smoother. So that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this week's special. As I say, we're back next week with a bit more on this. If you want to get in touch with Damien, you can do so in the usual way. It's Damien at moneytothemasses.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the usual places. All that's left for me, Damien, to say is until next time. Until next time. Oh.